Welcome to Schweitzer Drive, a podcast where we explore what goes on between the generation of electricity and the light switch. Join Dave Whitehead as he interviews the entrepreneurs, innovators, and experts who are inventing the future of electric power. Hello, I'm Dave Whitehead, CEO at Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories. Today, we're going to be tackling a topic I've been thinking a lot about, electric vehicles. And for us electrical engineers, what I like to refer to them as mobile loads, because in the morning, they're sitting in your garage, and then that load transfer, say, to the, the parking lot of our office buildings. So it's pretty pretty interesting to, to think about electric vehicles as, as, well, mobile loads or maybe some other kind of loads. But electric vehicles are projected to grow 36% annually, reaching 245 million vehicles by 2030, more than 30 times the levels they're at today. Um, and as an electrical engineer in the electric power industry, I have a question. Can we charge all those vehicles with our current electrical generation and distribution systems? Or what do we need to do to charge all of these vehicles and these big electric loads once they're really out there? To help me answer that question, I'll be talking with Dr. Brian Johnson. Brian is the Schweitzer Engineering Laboratory Endowed Chair in Power Engineering at the University of Idaho. Brian is a true power system expert, and he was also instrumental in helping launch U of I's new cybersecurity degree program. Brian has educated lots of engineers um, that are out there today practicing, and Brian also was my professor for a handful of courses. So, Brian, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Dave. All right, let's jump into this. Um, let's start all the way back at charging home or charging electric vehicles at our at our homes. Let's assume I'm driving in my new Ford F-150 Lightning electric vehicle, which I just saw on the news today. That thing is really, really cool. I bet it's, it is a ton of fun to drive. And I want to charge it up overnight. What are my options and how long is it going to ch- take to charge that, that electric vehicle um, with all the various charging options I, I might have? Okay, so... The primary charging options for a home, if you go by the standard chargers, are there's a, a sort of a type one and a type two charger. The type one charger is one that you would connect at a 120 volts and it would draw about 15 amps max. And the, the level two or type two charger, it can go up to 19.2 kilowatts, which works out to about 80 amps. And it would be primarily connected at either 208 or 240. And so if you have, let's say you have a, a 200 kilowatt hour uh, battery pack and you depleted it almost all the way and you're using a level two charger, then if it's, if you just take 200 kilowatt hours and about 20 kilowatts, you're talking 10 hours to charge it. But that's oversimplifying things a little bit because most of these chargers will charge at a high current early on. And then when you get closer to having the battery full, they don't draw as much because the, a lot of the batteries don't like to have a uh, full charging current at the end of the charging cycle. So that, that's interesting. So the, the type two, the big one, right? It's going to take 10 ish hours or so to, to, to charge my car. So that's a long time. So I understand there are, there are other chargers out there, the, the fast chargers and stuff like that. We'll probably get into that, but that, that's certainly not for residential use at this time. Um, and maybe those things need to change as, you know, we get more and more EV uh, integration in, in, into our homes. But I just don't see 10 hours, you know, well, for me anyway, maybe, maybe 10 hours is okay, but man, it seems like a long, long time. So really what what's probably limiting type one and type two chargers from being, you know, these really big heavy duty ones is that the, the breaker box I got in, in my panel, right? Is that, is that a limiting factor or? Well, say you have a 200 amp panel or 200 amp service for your home and you have an 80 amp charger. What else are you going to be doing at the same time? I'm probably not going to be washing the dishes or doing my laundry or something like that in, in the middle of the night when I, when I think they're going to try to, 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 to charge my thing. But that gets us to an interesting point. So I have a, say a 200 amp service coming into my home, right? There's a, probably a residential distribution transformer sitting out somewhere between me and my three neighbors probably are sharing one. What, what's what's going to happen 
to that transformer then if i've i've got an electric vehicle my neighbors both have electric vehicles and they all everybody wants to charge their vehicles plus run everything that was in their house so a lot of utilities have been looking at this uh, we actually helped a couple of utilities with some studies we did these with senior design projects about 10 years ago now that they were looking at when are we going to need to start upgrading service transformers? When do we need to upgrade our substation transformers if we have a lot of penetration? And what do you guys conclude? Or So based on the data they gave us, uh, I mean, they also looked at the scenario you talked about where you get an electric vehicle and then your neighbors see it and then they decide to get them <laughs> that they were expecting to see them come in clusters and there are certain neighborhoods that were more likely to be getting them than others. And so looking at what they had for transformers, looking at uh, where they where they were on their service life too. Uh, they always been five or 15 years depending on the transformer and the service. They also looked at uh, voltage drop issues mm -hmm. and when you increase that loading um, and then also just loss of life on the transformers if you run them if you overload them for a short time with the, the vehicles, even if you just have a peak charging, you're going to take life away. Playing that back, then it sounds like from, from your studies, there was a 15-year a runway with, you know, just how electric vehicles might show. Well, maybe, that, maybe that's not so bad, right? It gives you some time. But eventually, I got to believe you're going to have to put bigger transformers in or reconductor or whatever, just to, to support electrical load. So electrical vehicles certainly are a bigger one, but everything else that seems to be running on electricity. There's mandates from, a, a I think, a, a you know, a carbon neutral perspective, not to, to install gas furnaces or other gas appliances, rather. Houses should be all going um, all electrics, which is just going to cause bigger, bigger loads on these transformers. Some of the strategies or thinkings was to delay the the infrastructure costs was, you know what, I show up, I, I want to charge my car, but let's be smart about it because you have one too. And we probably don't want them charging at the same time in our houses, right? Have a little bit of diversity of, of load, if you will. So I'll, I'll charge mine from, pick, pick it from midnight to four o'clock in the morning and you charge yours from four o'clock till seven o'clock in the morning, right? And, and I... I, I bet, you know, the, the PhD guys all figure out the statistical modeling of this stuff and it, it all works out. I always get to the question, though, is uh, statistics are great if you're not the one actually involved in it, right? If I need to get up in the middle of the night, take a sick kid to the hospital and my, my charger it, or my car is in charge and we did some negotiation where I thought it was going to be charged, but no, 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 we flipped charging times or something like that. Do you, do you see any problems with the the practical versus the statistical side, or are there ways to overcome the, the, and I want to drive when I want to drive. So there are a lot of approaches people have looked at for how to manage charging, uh, ranging from just having a distribution level market where you have distributed uh, local marginal prices and people's chargers might control the sums based on that. The problem I see with that is that if you have enough electric vehicles that they start moving the, mar the market prices around, you could get things that are, get some interesting interactions. Uh, there are some other work that's been done, um, through some of the DOE national labs that have looked at, uh, much more involved management schemes where you have a central controller. And one of the schemes that, uh, one of my master's students did looked at first when everyone connects, uh, you set a priority for the charge. And part of it was also to get everything up to some minimum level of charge fairly quickly. And then once you get that, spread it, spread it out. But if there was somebody whose vehicle was already at 50% charge, uh, and they weren't planning to drive it till next morning, till the next morning, that one might have a lower priority and not charge as quickly. If somebody has it most of the way down, then it would try to bring it up to some ex minimum acceptable mm -hmm. level that the owner might designate when they enter the stuff into this so that that gets interesting right because you you buy an electric vehicle and, and to some degree you, you you lose the ability to control how and when you might want to drive it I, you know i certainly don't have that problem i drive up the safe way i stick my the the gas nozzle in my my truck and i'm ready to you know in 10 minutes i'm ready to go another 600 miles or or, or so in in that vehicle and so it's a different 
a different way to think, you know, of course my, my first reaction is to say, well, that's terrible. I want to do things when I want to, I want to do things. I had a, a, a friend who bought a Tesla and he had that, what do they call it? The range anxiety uh, syndrome, right? He said he had it for about the first week, you know, will I be able to get home if I'm, if I'm on the freeway or something like that? And, he, and, and he got over it. Maybe that's something I, I, I need to do then too, right? This, this, Get get over the feeling of uh, I want to go when I want to go or, or or what have you, um, but that's moving over to the psychology versus the the, the engineering side of the these these EV challenges. Yeah, and even some of this, uh, I mean, I can remember uh, my father or my grandparents when I was a kid that they never let their gas tank get below half full, so they had their own version of range range anxiety then. I. Uh, well, to be full disclosure or totally honest, I have the same thing. And if I if I get into a car and it's less than a quarter a tank, you know, one of ours, it's like, man, I'm yelling at my kids right away, right? There's there's no reason you should ever be below a quarter of a tank. And my kids, I think, like to try to how close can they get it to empty and and still still get another mile or so out of the out of the car. I can only imagine what they do with electric vehicles. And I don't know how to how do how do you recharge a car on this? I and mean, maybe that's a whole new industry, right? You ran out of electricity in your ev and you have to pull off to the side of the road what do you what do you do so i've heard people talk about having portable uh charging trucks that you could drive out to do things like that that's with the tow truck with a fast charger or something like that now i i'm not familiar do you have to have a different plug for fast chargers versus the slow chargers yeah because well it depends on the the manufacturer yeah and so uh, a lot of times you'll have multiple ones because the fast chargers are coming in at a different voltage yeah. and they want to make sure in some cases that you don't mix them up. Yeah, yeah. It's just like you don't want to put diesel in your 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 regular gas, right? So I got to imagine you got this Swiss Army knife of adapters. Maybe it's just like your iPhone or something like where you're carrying it, you know, and USB and iPhone and all these cables to, 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 to charge various, various devices. So you said that the Transformers probably... Uh, um, 15 years out, maybe, you know, just roughly speaking. What about going all the way back to the infrastructure then to the um, substation? You got cables, you have overhead stuff, you have transformers then at, at, at distribution levels. Is it is it out about on the, the same time frame, you think? So the utility that we did most of the work for was looking at something that had fairly new distribution in the neighborhoods that mm-hmm. had the students look at. So they didn't, they were farther out on that. Okay. But I've also done some other projects for other utilities where they have um, distribution bottlenecks already with some of their underground cables. Mm -hmm. So that they would probably need to do some upgrades on places where they have those limits. At some point, you're going to have to put in some more more infrastructure, right, to support these. The, I'll, I'll argue a car is a really big load, right? And if you really want to charge it fast, it's a really, really big load, right, at least for, for, for a short amount of time. So then we get into the – so if there are going to be 245 million new vehicles, electric vehicles, by, by 2030, how much infrastructure are we going to need and how much more electricity will we need to be generated – and what do you think the best ways or the best generation source to meet that demand might be? So when you say generation source, you would also have to consider, do you have generation and storage, or is it just going to be a generation um, source? I, that's all, that's, I'm leaving that up to you. You're, you're the professor that thinks about all this stuff, right? Yeah. So, I mean, some of the fast charging stations already have plans where they're, they're putting in storage. And what type of storage is that? Just lithium-ion batteries or... Uh, I mean, if it's Tesla, it's it's their power, power walls. wall. Yeah. Uh, and right now, lithium ion batteries are pretty much the the battery of choice for a lot of these applications, just because of cost and where the where they are for mm-hmm. for the market. Uh, some people have talked about using batteries for electric vehicles that have hit their end of life, but still have some capability, have a lot of their capabilities, and then using those for the the storage for the power stations. Would that be grid level storage or would these these storage units be right next to to chargers, you know, maybe residential or in my home or at Safeway? So for I was thinking more for fast charging stations. Yeah. But for home home storage, I mean people have talked about uh possibly increasing home storage for a long time. But really what it comes down to where are you going to put grid level storage on a is where is there going to be space? Mm-hmm. So if you have substations that have space for it and the utility wants to get in that business, then they might put it in their substations. If somebody is putting in 
their own fast charging station that's not owned by the utility. It's going to be where it, where they can get land at a reasonable price. Have you have you looked? Have you guys done much work then with storage, whether it's batteries or whatever else, flow batteries or or, or whatever? And and are they necessarily practical? I know you know it's it can be really expensive for a battery system, and then they talk on the order. So maybe you get a one megawatt, one megawatt hour, or three megawatt hours are really really expensive. And the big it's maybe it seems like when you're comparing it to a D cell battery, that seems like a lot of energy. But when you look at power you need to, to to run a city or something like that those those numbers get really really small really really quick in terms of the amount of energy they can provide to a, a community so if your goal is to keep from having to turn on like a 20 megawatt or 30 megawatt power plant for three hours that's that's a lot of energy mm-hmm. if you're mainly just trying to run a fast charging station where you're expecting like 20 or 30 cars you can kind of size this based on what your load is mm-hmm. uh, and what people are willing to pay for the fast charging. That's interesting, though. I, I hadn't thought of well, I'm just thinking about it now. So you use those batteries for uh, uh, helping doing fast charging stations. That that That's really cool. But that means you, you, you use the number 20, 30 cars or something like that. You are just cycling those batteries up and down, right? And that, that has got to just be a, a tremendous wear out mechanism for for those things. I wonder if that that pencils out economically to be able to just uh, abuse the batteries like that. Oh, and it depends on the battery uh, chemistry. Mm-hmm. Some batteries can handle that cycling a lot better than others. Yeah. And are you going to cycle them between 90% and 10%? Or are you going to cycle them between 75% and 30%? That's that, that that is an effect on their life too. Yeah, and that and, but that's going to drive the economics too, right? Yeah. If you can cycle it from ninety to ten, you need a lot less battery. If you're only going to cycle it from ninety to to seventy or something like that, and then you get back to your space uh, constraint problem that you have. It's like wow. So I bet Ford had the same challenges. Hey, I want to build a Model T, right? It's like how am I going to distribute gas all over the place? And had to maybe not the exact same challenge, but certainly challenges of how do you do distribution for 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 your particular product. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot. I, I've read stuff about when in the early days of autos when, I mean, the roads were, weren't ready for cars then either, right? Yeah. And the whole infrastructure for fuel and fuel distribution wasn't there. Have you, I, 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 I this, this made me think of Ford. I saw uh, like a vintage old movie must have come from, I don't know, the, the, I don't know when it was thirties or forties or something like that. And what it was is literally it looked like a, a model T truck, but it was a, it was a battery operated car and it, it drives into the service station. And what they did was they popped the, the hood off this thing and got a, a, a jack and pulled out the battery system out of the front of the car, dropped it in and put another one. And that, that's how they, they, um, uh, continue to go down the road then. So it was swapping out batteries. I've heard that that's some folks are, are looking at that as a, as an option. Do you know much about that, that way? So instead of having to wait to charge, you just swap out batteries and there's kind of this, this pool of batteries you go through. In the nineties, when there was a, a big push, one of the first pushes towards electric vehicles, that was the main choice was actually ba- battery swapping. Mm-hmm. And one of the questions was, who is going to pay for the infrastructure? Who is going to pay for the batteries for the swapping? But that was definitely something that was looked at a lot. Now that, that could be fast. Now I don't know. I don't know my battery anymore. I just rent them or, you know, that, that, that gets a little bit interesting. Uh, different way to think about the economics and ownership and, and what have you. If you had to, to, to crystal ball out, do you, do you think the 245 million vehicles in 2030 is an, an achievable thing or is it something else is going to have to change? And is it going to, are we as, well, at least in America, are we going to embrace this, this electric vehicle paradigm shift from our, our, well, reciprocating engines? So I think that the paradigm shift is going to be an interesting one because there are an awful lot of people that are not going to be ready to buy a new car. Mm-hmm. That th- there are people that are just going to go from one used car to one used car. So if there gets to be a developed aftermarket for selling electric vehicles, some of those people may switch them. But, yeah. but they're not going to probably be in a rush unless the price really comes down. The other thing that I see is going to be a big challenge is if these are all lithium-ion batteries, um, then 
even the whole supply chain for getting lithium is going to be an issue. The, the rare earth elements, uh, that go into, if the motors, a lot of the motors in these are permanent mega motors. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are some more efficient designs that don't require permanent magnets, but there's still trade offs. Yeah. And so, right, the rare earth elements is also going to be a big challenge for scaling it up that much. Then some, certainly something we weren't talking about here is what do you do with the batteries once, once they're end of life, right? They, those are a lot of nasty chemicals in those things, right? It's, it's probably almost like a nuclear problem. It's like, where do you bury this stuff or how do you dispose of it? Can you recycle everything or a lot of challenges there, I think. Yeah. And there's, there's a very well established system for recycling lead acid batteries. Yeah. And so that's, but it's not really in place for the lithium ion batteries or even for the, the power electronics that you would have for the, the converters for them. It's, it's, this is, this is really, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited and, and maybe a little apprehensive all, all at once. I, we got a lot of challenges with, I think, where are you going to get the electricity from? How's it really going to get to my house to charge my car? And then we have the price points for all of these things too. You can only subsidize, I think, so much. And the, the cars are so expensive right now that, you know, only rich people can really afford to, to, to buy them. And then, why give them a subsidy if they can afford to buy them anyway? But now, now that's the whole economic part of the, the the electric vehicle. And we started off talking about the the electrical engineering side. Are you going to buy an electric vehicle? I'm interested in doing it. My wife's not as interested in What? Does she have range anxiety? <laughs> no, uh, more that the cars that we have, we don't really drive that many miles. Yeah. So it's hard to justify getting a new car if we don't, if we hardly drive. Yeah. Now, and why would, why do you want to get one? Um, or why would you get one? Well, I, I'm looking at it more because I think that the technology is is interesting, and uh, just I guess some of the ones were just I mean for the environmental impact and stuff like that. I could see I see benefits to it. I think just would also be real interesting. Of course, in some ways, I'd rather just convert a car on my own too. But. Well, that'd be a fun engineering project. We could have a whole different show on 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 how you go about doing that. I you know if you'd ask me if I'm going to get an electric car. Two years ago, I said, now, what am I going to get one? I live in the middle of a wee field. You know, I need to go far, far, far. I can't worry about charging and stuff like that. These days, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to get one at some point. I think right now, my idea is it's going to be a toy, right? I think it's like, I think if you stick an iPad on anything, it's the, the latest and great. Like a Tesla is a big iPad with four wheels. I've got a Peloton that's got an iPad on it, just a stationary bike. So the, the technology and what you can do with it and the, the, the interaction with it is really clever. And and the, the torque to those things you know, the electric vehicles generate is just amazing, right? So if you want to have fun going fast, at least for a short distance, right? The, I think the electric vehicles are, are, are the way to go. Um, Brian has been fascinating talking about electric vehicles. Any, any parting thoughts on, on electric vehicles and may, maybe encouraging students to, to go look at electrical engineering, electric vehicles. It'd be fun to build an electric vehicle. Like you pointed out from an engineering standpoint. Well, I've been looking at electric vehicles since the late 1980s. And watch the technology grow, watch the battery chemistries change, the chemistry of choice for them. And there are still a lot of challenges out there. There are a lot of interesting problems for engineers to look at. Well, when I go buy a Ford Lightning F-150, we can come over to my house. We'll tear it apart and see how it runs. Thanks, Brian, for joining me today. This has been a, 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 a lot of, well, a lot of interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for stopping by Schweitzer Drive. Join us again as we learn about, explore, and celebrate electric power. For more information about the show, please visit selinc.com slash Schweitzer Drive.